Hello, uh, I'm Norbert Bleich, MD, and uh, I'm the medical director and chief scientist at the Center for Human Reproduction. I am uh, very pleased to have the opportunity uh, to take you on a little information journey today about the importance of the egg. And um, I think that is a very crucial and central point in female infertility. Uh, so uh, the title of the talk, uh, it all starts with health uh, of the egg uh, is not accidental. Before I get into the topic, uh, a conflict statement and uh, particularly important regarding this talk is that I do have uh, potential conflicts of interest in talking about androgen hormones, DHEA su supplementation and other androgen supplementations um, and because I own shares in a company um, that produces a DHEA product. Uh, and I also receive royalties for some patents uh, regarding use of androgens in female infertility. So please consider that when listening uh, to my talk. And uh, it was not our brilliance and our own idea uh, to make this point. Uh, probably the most uh, popular book on uh, infertility currently in the market. It starts with The Egg by Rebecca Fett. Uh, has exactly that title. And I was very pleased not only uh, to be quoted in her book, but I was very pleased uh, that she was really instrumental in bringing this idea uh, into the general public because it really is all or almost all uh, in the egg. And what I'm showing you here in this slide is an ultrasound. And it shows you how an ovary may look in your natural cycle or in the natural cycle of a woman, because in a natural cycle, uh, a woman develops only one growing dominant follicle that in the end ovulates. Uh, and uh, therefore a natural cycle produces only one egg. And uh, this brings me to infertility treatment where the ovary looks very differently. And you see here how a stimulated cycle, meaning uh, a cycle where a woman is receiving fertility drugs looks. And as you can see, she not only has one big follicle, but she's developing many big follicles because what is happening uh, in a stimulated, in a a cycle where a woman uh, receives medications uh, to stimulate her ovaries, uh, instead of most of the developing follicles dying off and the cycle being left only with one uh, dominant follicle, these medications that we are giving to women uh, through injections called gonadotropins or even other fertility drugs they allow survival of more follicles. And therefore, in a stimulated cycle, we are getting many more eggs. Uh, so the rationale of uh, stimulating uh, the ovaries rather than using natural cycles is not different than the principle of buying more tickets in the lottery to improve one's chances. Here, by having more eggs, uh, we can produce more embryos than just one embryo, and therefore we can improve pregnancy chances. And this is how ovulation looks in a picture that has become very famous. You can see here how the, the uh, follicle uh, ruptures, and it extrudes its egg. And this egg is being caught uh, by 
the fallopian tube by the fimbria, the, the finger-like structures of the fallopian tube, and this egg enters after it ovulates the fallopian tube. And this is shown in this picture very uh, nicely. You see here at the bottom uh, of, of this graphic, uh, the, the, the egg that is extruded from the follicle, it is caught by the fimbria here. It enters the fallopian tube. It meets somewhere here in the distal third of the fallopian tube. It meets sperm uh, that has come up the other way from the vagina through the uterus into the fallopian tube. So the, the sperm is arriving from the uterus and comes this way and egg and sperm meet roughly here at this point. And this is where fertilization takes place. And it is important for you to understand that when fertilization happens, one sperm enters the egg. In other words, the sperm and the genetic material that the sperm brings with it, the paternal genetic material, enters the female environment. And that is very important uh, as a concept because that explains why 95% of embryo quality is dependent on the egg and only roughly 5% on the sperm. And that's why the egg is so tremendously important. Once fertilization happens, uh, this fertilized egg, now called the zygote, uh, starts a journey down the fallopian tube. And on this journey, uh, this original zygote first divides into two cells, then four cells, then uh, eight cells. By the time this embryo reaches the cavity and implants, usually in the, in the upper portion of the uterus, by that time, the embryo is at what's called the blastocyst stage, which means that it has too many cells to count. And it is at that stage that the embryo implants. But I hope that understanding this journey alone already uh, gives you a good explanation why the egg is so important. Uh, in everything that has to do with reproduction. As I already said, 95% of the ultimate embryo quality comes from the egg and only very little uh, from sperm. We men, therefore, have really only one function. Our sperm needs to fertilize. And once uh, that happens, uh, the egg takes over. So I mentioned also that that first cell is called the zygote. It's the first cell of every human being. It's the first cell of every animal. The sperm has entered the egg uh, and its environment. And what that in practical terms means is that this first cell of the embryo must have all the genetic information for each human being. Think about that. The whole program for our existence is present in this microscopic single structure, this single cell called the zygote. Uh, again, re-emphasizing the importance of the eggs. And therefore, everything really starts with the egg and we must make every possible effort to maximize egg quality. And uh, this is uh, what I personally consider one of the big changes, uh, one can't even call, almost call a revolution, that has taken place over the last 20 years, uh, because for the longest time, we used to believe that an egg is an egg and that there's very little we can do 
about affecting the quality of the egg and therefore the quality of the embryo. As we have learned more and more uh, over the last 20 years, uh, it has become apparent that there are many things we can do to get better eggs uh, and that, um, in other words, we can affect egg quality. And egg quality is known to decline with advancing female age, uh, but egg quality can also decline in young women. And when that happens, we call it premature ovarian aging. And what that means usually that in parallel, uh, two things happen that both the quality and the quantity of egg production uh, declines ahead of time. So a woman who suffers from premature ovarian aging, and that is roughly 10% of all the female population, um, independent of race, ethnic background, or wherever you live, uh, those 10% of women have fewer eggs left in the ovaries at any given time point uh, and therefore they are prematurely aging their ovaries, meaning that, uh, you know, a 28 year old uh, can have 40 year old ovaries, or at least ovaries that behave like those of a normal 40 year old. Uh, quantity runs in parallel with quality, with one exception, uh, and I don't have the time to go uh, into this detail, but as a principle with that one exception, usually women who produce fewer eggs as one, than one would expect also have poor quality and vice versa. Now, egg quality can also be affected by the environment. It can be affected by drugs. It can be affected by diseases. Uh, and uh, in general, uh, the ovary is a very vulnerable organ. Uh, it is uh, very extremely vulnerable to toxic uh, medications, uh, chemotherapy. It is very vulnerable to radiation therapy. Uh, and therefore, uh, unfortunately, young women who require certain treatments for either cancer or other diseases that uh, use toxic medications for the ovaries, very frequently end up in premature menopause uh, because the eggs are uh, ruined by those treatments. Now, many colleagues still believe that egg quality is fixed and can never be improved. Uh, I have to say they're wrong. And uh, why is it that I can say that with such certainty? Uh, we obviously uh, have a very hard time doing experiments in humans when it comes to egg quality. Uh, it's almost impossible to do. Uh, but there are uh, extremely good animal models available, and now also uh, stem cell models that, that can, can model almost any in vivo process. And we have considerable evidence at the present time that we can improve egg quality to some degree. What we cannot do is we cannot take an older ovary and make it younger. But what we can do, and what is frequently misunderstood even by colleagues, we can maximize whatever capability an ovary has still left. And when we are talking about uh, changing the quality of eggs, that's really what, what we are talking about uh, in this context. We are trying to maximize the potential of the remaining follicles and the remaining eggs. How can that be done? Maximize your health, live a healthy life, work out, lose weight if you're overweight, eat an anti-inflammatory diet, 
Uh, don't use recreational drugs. Get enough sleep. In other words, live a healthy life. If you do that, you will also improve the quality of your eggs. And then there's obviously stress. And even though it is very difficult to quantitate stress, uh, in general, we do not consider stress to be a good thing. And if all of this doesn't help and you still have a hard time conceiving, then find the right fertility center for yourself. What does that mean? Do it as early as you can, because over age 38, fertility treatments very quickly lose the efficiency. What does that mean? It means that the same treatment will be less and less successful as a woman gets older and older. How do you find the right fertility center? Well, there are lots of fertility centers in the US. Uh, the number is probably over 500 by now. Wouldn't surprise me if we soon reach 600. But there are, certain, there, there are certain characteristics that at least in our opinion define a good fertility center. A good fertility center should not jump to conclusions. It should get a detailed history from you. Nothing is as important as a good history. We'll do some testing on you and your partner uh, because in roughly one quarter of all infertile couples, there's a problem on both sides and we would look pretty silly uh, if we treat only one side only to discover six months later after nothing has happened that the other side has a problem too. Uh, but in most, um, uh, even more important, uh, it is important to understand what you are treating. In other words, it is important to reach a diagnosis. We see a lot of patients who come to us with a diagnosis of so-called unexplained infertility, which paradoxically is still uh, a, a recognized diagnosis in many textbooks in our specialty, uh, but in itself, it's an oxymoron. Obviously, something is unexplained if you don't know it, but to find something, you have to dig. And the deeper you dig, the more you will find. So we uh, here at our center uh, do not believe in this diagnosis and uh, we dig deeply until we have a diagnosis. Uh, another crucially important uh, point in at least our opinion at CHR is that we do not feel competent to tell other people how to live their lives. And therefore, we will never dictate a patient uh, how and which treatments to pursue. We feel very, very qualified, in contrast, uh, to inform patients objectively what their different options are and to be brutally honest about what the chances are with those various options. Uh, but then it is up to the patient to decide which of these options they choose. There's never only one option. That is important to remember. If anybody ever tells you there's only one option, don't believe it. There are always more than one option. There are always better and poorer chance options, but uh, patients have also the right to choose a poorer chance option if it fits better into their beliefs, if it fits better into their plans for their life, etc. We are not here to tell anybody how to live their lives. The big decisions in infertility are, of course, always working with one's own eggs or working with donor eggs a very tough decision and certainly not the decision that I can make for anybody else. I can only propose it as an option. The same for sperm, working with one's own sperm or use donor sperm, very frequently an issue for couples. To use a gestational carrier uh, or 
to insist uh, to have the experience of carrying a pregnancy. For some women, it's important. For others, it's not. It's not for me to decide. It's for the patient to decide. But remember that there's always a choice. And ask for your choices. And make the decisions according to your needs. Now, every IVF center has a way of doing things. And there are sometimes considerable differences in how different centers pursue uh, fertility treatments. Uh, in that context, I can only talk about the Center for Human Reproduction, uh, where I work and what we do. First of all, safety comes first. Uh, secondly, uh, we will always put use of your own gametes, your own eggs, your own sperm before using third-party donor gametes. Uh, and if there is a reasonable chance, uh, we will never recommend uh, the use of donor. Uh, we consider using donor gametes a last resort. It's a wonderful option if there is no other option. I'm not so sure that it is such a wonderful option if there are other options. In contrast to many IVF centers, we are not big fans of freezing. Now, sometimes we have to freeze, especially if we have more eggs or more embryos or more sperm uh, or other reasons why we cannot use uh, uh, embryos or gametes fresh. Uh, but every time we freeze, we know that even the best laboratory loses some frozen materials, either in the freezing process or in the thawing process. And that alone already reduces pregnancy chances. And then there is very strong evidence, contrary to what some colleagues are claiming, that uh, just the freezing process, even if the eggs survive or the embryos survive seemingly normal, produce lower pregnancy chances than fresh gametes and fresh embryos. At our center also, we make sure that validated treatments come before experimental treatments. And if something is experimental and, and we consider something experimental, if we cannot reliably predict outcomes, then uh, we, we uh, will tell the patient that it is experimental and will require special consent. We use unvalidated treatments only under experimental protocols, meaning in, in study setups. And finally, nobody starts at our IVF cycle until, as I mentioned before, we have maximized the patient's ovarian function. Um, that is a crucially important point in our management strategy. Now, what does that mean? And that brings me to uh, some of the potential economic conflicts I alluded in my introductory slide. Uh, every one of our patients is on prenatal vitamins. Uh, patients above age 40 and women, younger women, with uh, poor ovarian reserve or premature ovarian aging uh, are put on DHEA, 25 milligrams TID, and they go, go on this at least six to eight weeks before IVF cycles start. This is a crucial feature in how we maximize ovaries because there is uh, a large number of studies in the literature by now in small animal models, large animal models, uh, and there are clinical studies uh, in humans uh, that suggest that um, low androgen levels are detrimental to IVF cycle outcomes, and if one raises them, uh, then one gets better outcomes. DHEA is a natural hormone, meaning that our bodies are producing it. Uh, 
in a woman, roughly half of her DHEA comes from the ovaries, the other half of her androgen hormones come from the adrenal glands. And it is usually the component coming from the adrenal glands that becomes deficient if there is a low androgen level present uh, in women. Now, uh, supplementing androgens, including DHA, has remained a controversial issue uh, because there are no prospectively randomized studies of adequate power, adequate size, and adequate quality uh, to support them. And the reason is simple, because I can speak from experience because we have twice tried to organize a prospectively randomized study and have twice failed because women don't like to get randomized and I can't blame them. If you have low variant reserve and your time is limited, you don't want to take the chance of being on placebo for six or eight months. But uh, prospectively randomized studies, while being the gold standard of studies, are not the only way to uh, develop evidence. Uh, another very important way are animal uh, models. And as I mentioned already twice before, there are now a large number of animal models which have developed the whole biochemistry of why androgens are important for good ovarian function, at what stages of follicle development they are important, etc. So we here uh, at our center consider this a settled issue. Some of our colleagues disagree with us and they are obviously entitled uh, to their opinions, but frankly, I think uh, they are pretty wrong. Uh, we combine DHA supplementation with an antioxidant. Antioxidants uh, are important to recharge the cells in our body. And they do that uh, by recharging what's called the mitochondria. And the biggest cell in a woman's body is the mature egg. It has the largest number of mitochondria, therefore needs the largest uh, energy, not surprising considering all the genetic material uh, it, it contains. And therefore, uh, we also pre-supplement with uh, roughly a thousand milligrams of uh, CoQ10 uh, as an uh, antioxidant. And um, uh, this can be uh, replaced by ubiquinol at roughly 600 to 800 milligrams per day. A final word on one other supplementation that has become again vogue in the IVF field in recent years. It was once vogue about 30 years ago, but then disappeared and now has a resurgence and that is the use of human growth hormone. We considered an experimental procedure as many of our colleagues don't. And we use it only uh, based on a study that we recently conducted uh, when patients have low IGF-1 levels. Uh, IGF-1 stands for insulin growth factor, and it is the active substance that exerts the human growth hormone effects. In other words, human growth hormone does not very much. Human growth hormone, however, releases IGF-1, and it is the IGF-1 that has beneficial effects on ovaries. And if that does not work, then we have another experimental treatment. Uh, some people call it ovarian rejuvenation. We, again, uh, as an experimental treatment, uh, do it only as uh, a study format. Uh, we have three registered studies going on this. It involves the injection of platelet-rich plasma uh, into the ovaries, and I don't have time to go any further, um, but our preliminary results are surprisingly good, at least in a small group of patients. Now, androgen uh, supplementation, as I already mentioned, is still considered um, 
controversial, but we are absolutely convinced that it improves in women with a low ovarian reserve and or premature ovarian aging. Uh, it improves egg numbers and even more importantly, egg quality. Uh, we also think to under, believe to understand why some of the data in the literature have been uh, controversial. And we think that the principal reason for that is um, that many colleagues use androgen supplementation only during IVF cycles or starting a week or two before. Uh, but uh, that is the wrong way of doing it. And it is the wrong way of doing it based on our now really well-established understanding of how androgens work in ovaries. And it is well-established, I think, beyond any reasonable doubt that good androgen levels are important for the very early stages of follicle maturation, right after follicles are recruited out of the dormant state in which uh, they are from birth. And it is these early stages that need good androgen level. But follicles at these stages still take at least six to eight weeks before they become available in IVF cycles. And therefore, if you just supplement androgens during IVF cycles, or even a week or two before, you are not treating the eggs that will be used in that IVF cycle. You may be treating the eggs that would become available a month or two later. And that's unfortunately what is happening in many IVF uh, centers. And therefore, it is really important not only that you supplement women with low ovarian reserve with androgens, but that it be done physiologically correctly. So uh, this means androgen supplementation six to eight weeks before IVF cycles start. The same thing I propose applies to what I mentioned before about human growth hormone because IGF-1 also only affect or primarily only affects small growing follicles. Let me conclude by again repeating that uh, in our experience, very significant improvements have been made in the last uh, two decades in maximizing ovarian performance at all ages, producing more and better quality eggs and embryos, and therefore getting in poor prognosis patients, better pregnancy and life birth rates. Further progress uh, will require further research, and it will mean that we will have to go earlier and earlier into follicle maturation to try to get more and more effects in improving eggs, because the journey between uh, recruitment of eggs until ovulation of eggs and creating an embryo can take months uh, to believe that at the very end of this journey, we can have still major impact is naive. We obviously have to try to intervene earlier and earlier in this journey. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. This is a picture of our center in Manhattan and a list of uh, my coworkers at the center. And I thank you for listening. <laughs>